welcome everyone to the Clean Water Initiative Lecture Series. This is the second lecture in our 2017-2018 series, and today we have Patrick Monks, the Stormwater Program Manager for the Department of Environmental Conservation, presenting on the Stormwater Rule and General Permits Update. Um, I just wanted to give a quick reminder before we get started that our next lecture series will be held on November 9th, and that's going to be covering the restoration of Lake Memphremagog and the total maximum daily load for, or TMDL for Lake Memphremagog. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. For folks on the line, if you have any difficulty seeing the PowerPoint slides or hearing, please let me know via instant messenger. And I'll also be fielding any questions or comments for online participants through the instant messenger on Skype. Uh, so that, take it away. Great. Thank you, Emily. Um, Thanks for coming. Again, my name is Patrick Monks. I manage the uh, Department of Stormwater Program. Those of you I haven't met, um, I've got about, um, I don't know, 15, maybe 20 minutes, not even worth of slides. So I can, you know, sort of run through those and leave time for questions. But certainly, you know, if, if questions come up along the way, that's fine as well. I'm going to cover um, our forthcoming update of the stormwater rules. I'm going to plan to cover uh, the reason for the update, uh, what changes or new standards uh, that will go into effect, and the timing and the process for the adoption of the rule. As to why it's required, um, we have a mandate from Vermont, uh, from uh, Act 64, also known as the Vermont Clean Water Act. The rule will consolidate three existing stormwater rules. For those of you who have uh, done any work with our program, uh, we've got a, a, a rule for Unimpaired waters for impaired waters, um, an older rule that governs federal uh, our federal programs. Uh, so this will also develop some state rules for our Clean Water Act based programs because currently we operate directly under federal regulations for those programs. And again, um, it allows us a chance to uh, develop the new requirements. So what are we going to accomplish? We'll have one rule for operational permitting construction multi-sector general permit uh, for industrial stormwater, our municipal roads general permit, our MS4, or municipal separate storm sewer system program, uh, designation authority, and CAFO, or concentrated animal feeding operations. So that's going to be a beast of a rule. It's, you know, over, over 100 pages. Um, what's good about it, it, it consolidates all our requirements into one place. So that's, that's good for us, for our program, and I think also for the public in that there's one place to look to identify why is it we do what we do and what our standards are. Um, it's largely, you know, a, I wouldn't say administrative, but to a large degree, it's a, it's a repackaging of existing authorities and rules. But with that said, um, there are some significant new requirements that will be contained in the rule. Uh, we will. We are developing and identifying the requirements for what we call our three-acre sites, and I'll describe those in more detail in a minute. Um, we are going to expand our offset and impact fee program, and identify requirements for certain expired permits in stormwater impaired waters and Lake Champlain watershed. So, my my goal in, in the outreach that I've been doing is to really highlight what I see as the major. Uh, new developments in the rule. I'm not trying to steer anyone towards focusing on anything. You know, obviously, as soon as we have a, uh, a draft version of the rule, we will be sharing that with stakeholders and encourage folks to go in depth as as far as they're interested in. But again, here I'm just really trying to point out what what I feel like are the, the main new elements. Just to back up a little bit, as, especially as I talk about three acre sites and retrofits. The you know the the, jet, the the driving force behind that is largely um, informed by the Lake Champlain TMDL, and as part of that TMDL, and if you guys followed that process at all, I'm sure you've seen this pie chart or one like it a whole bunch of times. But it identifies that developed lands, uh, including paved roads and unpaved roads, so those top two right-hand corner slices of the pie, the, the reddish and the orangish one, make up 20% of the phosphorus load to Lake Champlain. TMDL also identifies that we need to reduce that load by 21%, roughly speaking, on average. Now, 
you look across the state, we've got 60,000 acres of impervious surface, two-thirds of that roughly in the Lake Champlain Basin. Less than 10% is currently regulated under a stormwater permit. So that's because most of the development predated our program or fell below our permit thresholds. So X64, um, in addition to requiring us to revise the stormwater rule, also requires that we develop and implement a program for what are called three acre sites. These are sites that have more than three acres of impervious surface that were either never permitted or were permitted under standards that predate the Vermont Stormwater Management Manual that was developed in 2002. Those being sort of the more modern era stormwater standards, those that came before 2002 being the older ones. So the, the idea here is to address the water quality impacts from all this legacy development that has taken place over decades or, or longer and which is currently un or under regulated. In the case of you know, National Life where we are now, um, you know, that in the upper left hand corner we've got that satellite parking lot. You know, that was newer and that was permitted to the 2002 stormwater manual. The rest of the development is under a, uh, a much older stormwater permit with uh, you know, much less effective best management practice standards. So the idea of the three acre general permit is to address these types of sites not just in the Lake Champlain Basin, but, um, but statewide. We are due to have the general permit in place by January. Essentially, it, it, will, it will move forward in parallel with the rule because the rule identifies um, you know, the significant technical requirements we're talking, um, up for the general permit. Um, we'll miss that deadline by a little bit, hopefully not much. Regulated projects are required to have permit coverage uh, by 2023 if those projects are in the Lake Champlain Basin, oh, you know, the western half of the state, the rest of the state. Projects are required to have permit coverage by 2028. Roughly, uh, and we're in the process of identifying you know, where these sites are, um, how many we have exactly, uh, but roughly we've got 1,000 of these projects statewide. The three acre general permit will require that these sites undertake retrofits. Um, as part of that, they'll be required to maximize treatment on site, and the standards that they'll follow are based in the Vermont Stormwater Management Manual, uh, the 2017 version, which just went into effect in July. Um, pro affected projects will potentially need to meet uh, upwards of three specific criteria in the manual. We call our water quality treatment standard, groundwater recharge, and channel protection. Uh, just for reference, a new project coming in that requires an operational stormwater permit would estimate um, there's six potential standards that they have to meet in the stormwater manual. So we've downsized it to focus on the pollutants of concern, you know, phosphorus in the Lake Champlain Basin, and excess flow in the stormwater paired waters, which is addressed through the channel protection standard. So the three acre sites are a massive category of retrofit projects that we'll be dealing with. We've also got a smaller but important category of expired permits in the stormwater impaired waters. These are projects that were permitted uh, quite a while ago, decades in some cases, um, that have been at somewhat of an impasse uh, due to statutory or legal impediments to renewing them and, and due to a lack of, the, you know, of our program to identifying and developing the technical standards that they'll need to meet. Uh, as part of the stormwater rule and the uh, forthcoming general permit, I describe it as a three-acre general permit, but really those requirements will be contained in a larger you know, general permit that covers all of our operational permitting. And just to back up one step, when I talk about operational permitting, I'm talking about stormwater from impervious surfaces. You know, and as described early on, we have multiple other stormwater programs, but most of the changes in this rule that have an impact on our program are really focused on the operational program. So in addition to the three acre sites, we've got these expired permits, um, and we'll be developing the standards that they need to meet yeah, uh, an expired permit that also has three acres of impervious surface. Those sites will simply follow the requirements that we develop from three acre sites. Um, other sites, if they are less than three acres, uh, 
They will also need to undertake a retrofit if that retrofit is necessary to implement, sorry for the acronyms, um, an FRP or PCP. FRP being a flow restoration plan. That would be the cleanup plan in one of the stormwater impaired waters. And PCP is a phosphorus control plan. So those will be the plans that municipalities, the MS4 municipalities, develop to implement the Lake Champlain TMDL. We essentially have a you know a statutory requirement and ability to impose conditions on projects as they renew their older permits <coughs> as necessary to implement TMDL. So that's where that comes from. Projects in the Champlain Basin that uh, you know, that are renewing their permit and that need an upgrade will be required to meet um, the recharge and water quality treatment standard. Additionally, in stormwater impaired waters, they'll meet those two standards and channel protection, again, to get at the uh, concerns of excess flow. So if you're renewing a permit in any of these impaired waters, and if you've got less than three acres, and you're not identified in a flow restoration plan or a phosphorus control plan, we don't otherwise determine that an upgrade is needed, those sites will be renewed like other projects statewide, the way we've been doing under Call general permit 3-9010. Um, if, if an upgrade isn't identified as necessary, then those projects are renewed based on demonstrating compliance with their existing permit conditions. So again, uh, the retrofit categories are three acre sites and permit renewals for these sites as they go through permit renewal and permitting for the first time. The goal is for these projects to meet the standard on 100% of the site. And we understand that that is much less achievable on, re on uh, retrofit sites versus new development on an undeveloped site. Consequently, uh, as uh, project designers assess what's feasible for the project, they'll be evaluated against a range of engineering feasibility analysis criteria. These are, are, are being modified. This is from these criteria are, are really close to what we have in our existing uh, residual designation authority general permit where we required projects to retrofit previously. Um, so we will be modifying these but imposing similar conditions. Essentially requires that you don't need to buy new land um, or do bad things to wetlands or stream buffers or pump your stormwater and so forth. So basically the, the, the goal of project designer is to meet the standards that I described, also acknowledging that there are certain limitations that should be considered um, when projects are identifying what they can do. <clears throat> now, as mentioned, we, we have experience doing that under the residual designation authority general permit. Um, it, it didn't affect nearly as many sites as the three acre requirements will affect. But you know, when projects went through that design process, we certainly saw some number that only implemented minimal to, to, no, to no new stormwater treatment practices because they demonstrated that it wasn't feasible. So our, based on that experience and also based on the requirement in Act 64 that our rule include the use of offsets, impact fees, and trading, um, we're proposing a impact fee system that will be applicable to projects that undergo a process and will apply to the portions of the project that don't meet the technical requirements. Impact fees are only applicable in Lake Champlain Basin and stormwater impaired waters. That's a statutory requirement. So the, the requirement to permit three acre sites applies statewide, but in statute offsets and impact fees, so forth, are defined as only being applicable in those, so I'd say the western half of the state, but there are a couple stormwater impaired waters that are outside the Lake Champlain Basin, Mount Snow, Killington. The idea is to provide incentive and equity, meaning the incentive is instead of a designer saying, well, what's the least I can do and meet the standard, it provides a back an incentive to meet the standard in that the extent to which they don't, they'll be subject to paying impact fees. It provides a form of equity in that if you've got two sites and one site can provide uh, you know, a significant level of treatment, 
and the site next door can't, it ensures that the site next door is still contributing to the overall solution. Simply put, the way the impact fee system will work is, again, the, the, the goal is for a project to provide treatment on 100% of the site if it can. Um, if there's a fee target that we're proposing, such that if a project provides treatment on less than 75% of the site, they'll pay an impact fee based on a sliding scale. Projects that, it can, that exceed the 75% fee target uh, are potentially eligible to receive fees Impact fee is up to $50,000 per acre of impervious surface. That's based on our existing impact fee that we've been using in the stormwater impaired waters for over a decade now. It's $30,000, um, adjusting for inflation. Uh, we consulted the engineering news record construction cost index from the period 2002 to 2017, 2002 being roughly the era where we uh, developed and uh, obtained um, local cost information regarding the cost of compliance with the stormwater manual and adjusted it for that period, which brought it up to 49000 and change, and we rounded it to 50000 50000 is further broken down into specific by specific treatment criteria. Uh, groundwater recharge, water quality treatment, and channel protection, as I noted early on, are the three criteria that retrofit projects potentially need to meet. So based on other published information, uh, we designed a $10,000 uh, fee to groundwater recharge, $15,000 to water quality treatment, and $25,000 to channel protection. So in the stormwater impaired waters, where all three criteria are potentially applicable, projects face up to $50,000 per acre uh, in previous surface in terms of impact fees. You're not in a stormwater impaired water, but in Lake Champlain. Because only water quality treatment and recharge apply, the maximum fee is $25,000. And I'd emphasize that those are maximum fees. I think it would be a, a rare project that provides no treatment. Most will provide some. The way the impact fee and watershed fund system would work in a nutshell is that for each stormwater impaired water, and for the watershed of each lake, seg lake segment in Lake Champlain, TMDL lake segments, a watershed fund will be created. We actually, those funds already exist in the stormwater repair waters. The projects that don't fully meet the standard of paying into that fund, the projects that exceed standards, are eligible to receive funds. Got a few examples, simple examples that, that, that cover these, these concepts. So we've got a, a, a hypothetical four-acre site. Again, the fee target is 75% of the site. In this case, happens to be three acres. So in this case, we'll assume the project designer undertook an engineering feasibility analysis, put in the best stormwater system they could, and it treated 75% of the site, three acres. Uh, so in that case, they're you know they come out with an impact fee of, of zero. They're they're neutral on fees. Take the same site, assume it's in the Lake Champlain Basin. Be target again at 75%. In this case, they're able to treat two acres, which leaves two acres untreated. Uh, fee target, uh, so essentially that they come up one acre shy of the fee target, so they're going to pay 25000 Same site, let's say they're able to provide, meet 100% of the standards on their site. 100% of their site meets standards. So in this case, they'll exceed the fee target by one acre and be eligible to receive upwards of 25000 Of course, there has to be money in the fund, assuming assume other projects have paid impact fees in order for projects to be eligible to be paid. Another example, um, called an offset or more of a voluntary project. Let's say you got a one acre site and they're undergoing an expansion. The expanded portion of the project needs a permit, needs treatment. They may say this is a good time to provide some treatment for the other half, you know, for portions of our site that never had treatment. Let's say it was built decades ago, never needed a permit. So they undertake the feasibility analysis and, and determine that they can treat a half acre that's not required to be treated. 
on that case, they're eligible to be paid on half acre times 25,000 or in this case 12,500. So the stormwater rule continues with our offset program. For those of you who've done work in stormwater impaired waters, you'll, you'll know that you know, we projects are required um, or have been required to meet net zero for that period before we have uh, cleanup plans in place that implement the, the, the TMDLs for the affected water. Uh, we still have a statutory requirement that if we're dealing with an impaired water that does not have a TMDL, I describe it as pre-TMDL. There's a requirement that they not increase the, the uh, pollutant load, and that offsets can be used to meet that requirement. That that won't change. I mean, what changes is that the offsets become applicable not just in stormwater impaired waters, but like Champlain. And just, you know, um, fortunately, by and large, we're talking the post-TMDL situation right now. We have a TMDL for Lake Champlain. We've got most of the flow restoration plans in for the stormwater impaired waters. So although we still got a couple ski areas and who knows, TMDL status can sometimes change, like we saw with Lake Champlain, there's always the possibility that we have to revert back to the pre-TMDL. But largely what we're talking about is post-TMDL. So what we're proposing is that um, offsets can be used for three acre sites and those specific permit renewal sites that I described that are required to undertake a certain amount of retrofit. Offsets will not be applicable to new development once we have a TMDL. Uh, the reason there, uh, meaning that three acre sites and the permit renewal sites, they are retrofitting you know, to an EFA standard. They're doing the best they can do, whereas new sites are required to meet treatment on 100% of their site. Some general changes to offsets. We have a category of offsets which we call off-site offsets. So if you were a developer, um, having gone through stormwater permitting and a stormwater impaired water over the last several years, you may have uh, developed an offset, meaning you, in order to meet your requirement to not increase pollutant loading, you may have found something else in the watershed to fix that offsets your increase in pollution. That project could be located some ways away from your project, and the way we've permitted those in the past is that they off-site offset, and the new project are all covered under the same permit. We've learned that that doesn't work well over time in terms of administrate, administrating that requirement. So we will have those off-site offsets will get their own stormwater permit separate from the development that needed the offset. Um, currently, offsets can include practices on farms, on roads, and streams. They're not common offsets. Well, roads, roads are fairly common. Um, it's difficult to do on farms currently. You're required to essentially consider all other options before you go that route. That's a statutory requirement. Uh, we're, we're proposing that we no longer allow offsets to occur on, on farms, roads, and streams because uh, we, you know, under the under Act 64, roads need to be, we, we're, adult, we're developing a municipal roads general permit. Those roads need to be brought up to standards anyway. And then once we're into the post-TMDL period, as we are in Lake Champlain, significant reductions are required from farms anyhow. So if we start having the developed land sector doing offsets on ag land, we can't really credit those projects towards meeting our developed land reduction requirements. So we propose to keep them separate for tracking other reasons. The so trade, again, X64 requires that we allow for the use of offsets, impact fees, and phosphorus credit trading. Trading is a fairly broad term, and um, we've sought to meet that requirement through the use of offsets and impact fees. To a lot of folks, trading can also mean trading between sectors, between stormwater and agriculture, or between stormwater and wastewater. You know, those are those are important concepts, and I appreciate that there's interest there, and we're you know committed to you know continuing to lead a conversation about um, the feasibility of those uh, requirements, but. There's, there's some significant policy and think, legal issues that really need to get addressed before we can go further in that regard. So we're not proposing to include them in the rule at this time. We know one of the major 
you know, obstacles that, that I see when we're talking about trading between, especially between stormwater and agriculture, the concept of trading is if you, something cannot be done, or if someone goes above and beyond what they're required to do, that can be applied to something else that needs to be done. But for both developed lands and agriculture, the lift is so high in both sectors. I, I really am you know, certainly open-minded to this, but I don't really see where the extra can be done or is being done such that we can say, okay, we can back off here and we're doing more here. And there's also issues of whether you know, that, that sort of um, flexibility between sectors is, is allowable under the TMBL. I know, you know we're, we're not closing the door on that. We just, you know, we do have the, the need to move forward now. And, you know, those conversations will take quite a bit longer than, than, uh, than we have at the moment. Right, as I mentioned early on, my goal here is to, is to direct your attention to what I, I think, you think will be the major changes in the role uh, and, and where we have, where we've you know, exercised our, our discretion. You know, there's, there's a lot of things that just have to be in the role, uh, statutory and federal regulatory requirements that we, we don't really have the ability to change, but where, where we've had to establish uh, new standards. That's what we're trying to point out here. So when we do get the rule out to you, uh, you've got a, an idea of where to focus. But again, please, I, I trust you will focus anywhere you see fit. So the key decision points, three acre sites. We've identified the treatment requirements. We have a, a statutory requirement to develop a program to address three acre sites, precisely what technical standard they need to meet is what we're proposing in, in the stormwater rule and will also be included in the general permit. Expired permits and stormwater impaired waters, you know, those have been the topic of conversation for a long time, a lot of years. And I think there was certainly an expectation uh, among some, especially in the MS4 communities, that perhaps all the expired permits in those impaired waters would be upgraded. And you know, given that there's a, a broad range in terms of the lift that needs to take place in those waters, meaning some almost meet standards today, some are a long ways from meeting standards. If, if a water can be restored or if the TMDL targets can be met by retrofitting three projects, do we really need to retrofit all of them? So we will you know, do it more sort of case by case to determine if the retrofits needed to implement the TMDL in those watersheds. Impact fees, again, we are required to have impact fees in the rule and the general permit. We've proposed that they're applicable both pre and post TMDL, that is, period before we have a TMDL and once the TMDL is in place. The level of fees, I described our current impact fees are 30,000 per acre. We're proposing to increase them to 50,000. Certainly welcome input on um, the sufficiency of that. Also the ability of projects to receive fees. Uh, we've got a long, a fairly long history of projects paying stormwater offset impact fees. Uh, Projects that have been able to receive those fees are projects that undertake offsets. Offsets as currently defined as being projects that aren't otherwise required. What we're proposing and the rule is that projects that are required to obtain permit coverage, but that exceed standards, not new projects, but retrofit projects, projects that exceed standards are eligible to receive those fees. Process and timing for going forward, again, uh, rules due under Act 64 in January. Uh, we'll miss that date by a little bit. We're undertaking stakeholder outreach now. Done a number of these presentations, had a lot of uh, just one on one or small group conversations. I'm uh, hoping to get the draft rule to ICAR, Interagency Committee on Administrative Rules, just as sort of being the point where we kick off the more formal portion of rulemaking and hoping to get to them by December. So we'll be taking public comment informally now um, and then right through uh, rulemaking. There's a formal comment period during the rulemaking period where we you know, have at least uh, one public meeting but accept public comment from them. As soon as we have a draft version of the rule, we want to share it with uh, all our stakeholders. We've got a list of several hundred folks who've ever expressed an interest in anything we do in the stormwater program, so we reach out to them and various groups. So we'll get that out for, you know, uh, at least some period of viewing before we actually file the rule. 
uh, information on, on the on the rule, uh, including copies of the presentation and the summary of some of our technical standards, is available on our website. That's, you can get to it by going through Watershed Management's website and going to Stormwater, or you can just if you just search by Vermont Stormwater Rule 2017, you'll you'll get there. You can certainly contact me. I encourage you to uh, phone, email, what have you. Uh, it's been really helpful talking to people about their specific questions and ideas to develop this. Um, it's been a busy year. Will continue to be a busy year. We're not just working on the Stormwater Rule. The new Stormwater Man Manual, uh, abbreviated as VSWIM there, as Vermont Stormwater Management Manual, went into effect in July 1 after a lot of work. We're in the process of renewing the multi-sector general permit for industrial discharges. That's already been out on public notice. Um, we're required by EPA to include a electronic reporting system so that Permittees are submitting their discharge monitoring reports and other reports through an electronic system. So we're working with a contractor to get that finished up. As soon as we do, we'll finalize that. The Municipal Roads General Permit, MRGP, <coughs> is currently on public notice through, I think, the 26th. Uh, Jim Ryan and company have had uh, two or three public meetings, and there's two or three next week, so a total of five. There's a 45-day public comment on that one. The MS4 general permit is due to be reissued. Uh, the current general permit expires in December of this year, so we'll be reissuing that and hoping to squeeze in the construction general permit as well. So we appreciate that's a lot for you know all of you, stakeholders, interested folks to keep track of. We didn't plan it that way. It's just the way it's rolling out. Um, we do appreciate the interest and the feedback that we're getting on all these efforts. So that's, that's it for the, the formal formal portion of the slides I have. Happy to talk about anything of interest to you, and I appreciate those of you who've suffered through this presentation more than once. And folks on the line, if you have questions, you can type them into Instant Messenger, and I'll uh, voice them for you. Patrick, are you going to, do you have any <coughs> fact sheets that Summarize some of these things up that we can forward to um, either town officials or private landowners if they ask. So I seem to be getting a lot of what What are the nuts and bolts of it? Yeah, anything, anything. yeah we've got to email you know, them like a PDF or something. We've got a, a fact sheet, but we've got stuff that's close to it, and you know I'm, I'm certainly hearing that a fair amount. Uh, and I, it's something we, we need to do, and I'd yeah, be happy to get something out. Um, and when does the public comment period end? Well, right that? now it's just sort of it's informal. Um, okay. the, they, and then there'll be a, I'm not sure, once, once, we, once we file the, 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 the rule itself, there'll be a formal period announced there, so we'll okay. get word out. So that'll be sometime later this fall or, or early okay. in 17. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we've got, there is, if you go to our website, there is um, a, a summary of the key technical changes, but it's really geared towards more stormwater practitioners, yeah, folks who are working in our permitting. Who, yeah, just something more layman's for the town select boards and planning right. commission. Folks, folks. Um, you know, the road the road crews are very well about. You know, they know all about the MRGP, but it's more you know the other types of sites that Agreed. some folks need to know about. Okay. Will do. Thank you. It makes perfect sense, or it's bewildering. Or <laughs> <laughs> um, you've been doing the pre rulemaking outreach for a while now. Do you anticipate making any changes before it goes to ICAR at this point? Not asking for specifics, I guess. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, just yeah. We, you know, just in terms of the feedback, we. We've got so far, you know, both internal and external, just in sort of key concepts. Um, you know, we spoke about some of the engineering feasibility criteria. Uh, you know, what does mechanical treatment mean? So we've we've taken that out, uh, trying to provide some better language regarding uh, the engineering feasibility analysis criteria related to wetlands. Um, all right. If you look at the RDA, the EFA criteria that we have in the old general permit. Um, the projects don't consider anything that will have any impact in the wetland or buffer zone. 
and not all wetlands and buffer zones are created equal, right? Some provide very high function, some don't. And so to prevent projects from just throwing up their hands and not going there, that perhaps a, a consultation of more project-specific review is needed. Um, also trying to um, refine the criteria for, as I described it, you know, projects need to meet water quality, recharge, channel protection. And the question came up about what about you know an existing site that's fairly well disconnected? That really isn't that much of a problem. And perhaps it's providing, it's not meeting the specific standards, but it's partially meeting them. And can we credit those? And one example comes up with some school that it's mm -hmm. kind of located sort of high and dry. And it might not meet the disconnection standards that we would apply to a new project, but maybe it's it's fairly well disconnected and isn't doing a lot. So how do we credit those so they don't spend a lot of money just to bring it up to meet a certain standard? So we're trying to refine that. Um, on the three acre sites, we've defined them as any parcel with more than three acres, or if it's multiple parcels and they were previously subject to a permit that covered more than three acres. So an old commercial park, maybe no particular parcel has more than three acres, but once upon a time they did something that needed a permit and that permit covers more than three, they're in. So looking at you know, some of the some of the projects that will likely be in, you know, if you look at parcel maps for a ski area or a college or a hospital, you know, sometimes there's some pretty awkward parcel configurations such that a parcel might lop off part of a parking lot. You know, so that parcel maybe was never under a permit. And that parcel's not over three acres, but it's clearly part of that entity. So they should probably be in. But what we aren't looking to do is going into old subdivisions that never had a stormwater permit and that aren't really otherwise affiliated and saying, all right, you know, you are now retroactively a common plan of development and you need permit coverage because where do you stop? I mean, yeah. so what does subdivision mean? All land was subdivided. It's just a question of how far back you want to go. Um, so th those are the sort of details that we're working through. I'm also trying to uh, proposed perhaps treating private roads differently. There's, a, there's certainly a lot of interest in private roads. And our answer, you know, especially coming from municipalities, like, well, if we're going to bring the municipal roads up to standards, what about the private roads? And, and our answer has always been, well, if the private road is over three acres, it will require permit coverage. And that's true. But if you've got a private road that is just sort of unto itself, meaning, let's say it's going through a subdivision that doesn't otherwise need a permit, applying the standards that we've proposed here don't really make a lot of sense you know, that they're more designed for you know a, a more rectangular project if you will so we're going to propose that those types of private roads that are really just the only thing that's regulated is the road that they follow standards similar to that we've developed for municipal roads and the same could apply to you know, ski areas have more remote roads you know, there's the road that goes right through the base of the ski area. We should treat that along with all the impervious next to it, but if they've got a work road that goes snaking up the hill, applying the BMPs and the stormwater manual to those roads isn't necessarily a good fit, or a road to a state park or something like that, where we really want them just to focus on road standards as opposed to uh, the other BMPs and the stormwater manual. So those are just a handful of things that, you know, that... Uh, we may see some changes to those things before it goes to ICAR. Oh, yeah, so they, they'll, they'll, all those will all be in the pre-draft that come out to you, and I expect we'll get more feedback, and so then I'm sure there'll be some level of change before it goes, before we file it, and then, you know, again, then there's the opportunity, you know, it does get harder, but certainly by no means impossible to make changes once we've um, started the formal rulemaking process. Just one other thing that came to mind, maybe not something for the rule, but I see you've got impact fees associated with the recharge standard, so consider how you're going to treat desoils. So I think the recharge standards waived, so I'm assuming payment wouldn't go to properties on desoils. Correct. Right. So yeah, under the feasibility criteria, if your project is waived from meeting, if some of the standards don't apply to all, some, all, all the projects, as Tom described. Uh, if you're a project on desoils, which are you know, soils that don't really infiltrate, then you don't have to meet recharge. So one, we wouldn't <laughs> charge you impact fees, and two, you wouldn't be able to say, oh, I've met recharge, I'm eligible for fees. You actually have to provide the treatment. But, that's something we've tried to articulate, but you know, 
we, re we write things and we know what they think they mean and we read them and they make sense, but once they get out there, those types of things that you know, you've got experience with, having your eyes on them will be really helpful. All right, any other questions? So Patrick, um, have you guys considered the impact or disincentive to the impact fees in trading structure maybe on towns or municipalities that are interested in integrated permitting. Uh, for instance, we're through FED, we've, we're funding a planning slash feasibility study so the city of Burlington can evaluate where they need to make stormwater improvements, do CSO work, uh, upgrade the treatment facilities, all in trying to ratchet down their overall phosphorus numbers. and. Uh, it, from, from the slide, it indicated that they, they would not be able to take credit for work done in one sector and apply it or, or receive either a reduction fees or receive fees from making improvements, say, at the wastewater and then uh, applying those to either stormwater or vice versa. So basically, if you, if you did a, a slam bang job at the treatment facility, would they have to reduce? Uh, less phosphorus from the stormwater side or from the development side. It, side and it, it seems like this structure would actually disincentivize that. Well, I mean, I, I think it's not clear that the projects can, or that a regulated entity can get credit towards stormwater by addressing wastewater at this point. So I don't, we don't, we don't create any new impediments to it. I mean, I think it's certainly worth keeping in mind preliminary feedback from Burlington has been relatively positive on, you know, creating those impact fees. I think they are supportive, and I don't want to speak for them at all. I mean, I've had minimal conversations with yeah. them, but they, they're supportive of a, you know, a, a stronger approach where we're really creating more of an incentive for projects to, to do things on site, mm -hmm. and um, it sort of reduces their, their burden. I mean, I think there's a lot of folks in the private community who are like, hey, it'd be a lot more cost effective if we just did all this on public lands, and I think Municipal perspective is we really should be managing a lot of the stormwater on private land. Um, so to the extent we're achieving reductions on three-acre sites and using those incentive, those those impact fees to create that incentive, I think they'll be supportive. Also, projects that are um, paying those impact fees, the MS4 communities are eligible to uh, to receive those fees for projects that they're implementing. Um, or most permittees, they can get, or they'd be eligible to receive impact fees, you know, if they exceed the standards as described, and MS Forest can certainly get in that line to do that, but, you know, on an annual basis, once we've allocated those fees, if there's fees left over, you know, municipalities may be well be doing projects that are good projects to do, but that aren't exceeding that 75% standard, they'll be eligible to receive fees based on cost, similar to what we, we do in the offices now, as, as you know, as your, as your division administers those, <laughs> that element of the program. But no, I, I think that's really good input, and I think it's something we should perhaps prompt you know any any community that's interested interested in integrated planning to to comment on. Um, I have a question. Another question. I don't know if you're the best person to answer this, but because it has more to do with funding for actually implementing the main retrofits, and I'm sorry to chime in on this, but um, I've gotten a few mixed messages whether it's a three-acre site or a retrofit on an expired permit, if it's um, like a municipality land versus private land, um, who's eligible for funding and who isn't through the, either the, um, our program or transportation alternatives or any, you know pretty much anything. And if private landowners are eligible, um, and if once the three-acre permit comes out, if that they say it's even a municipality one that they're eligible for funding sure. to, because you know they may not have you know, money to even upfront that to even get the um, intact, even if they treat the four acres to get that money back. Exactly. So. Yeah. I, um, like the short answer is I'm not the best person to talk about that, but just to to clarify, you know, the the impact fee system, it, you know, is perhaps one way. Um, mm -hmm. Helping you know facilitate implementation, creating incentives, creating fees for projects to go above and beyond. But it's not intended to be 
the funding solution by any means, and that there are still hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars to, you know, that we collectively are going to need to come up with in order to implement um, you know, all these required fixes. And uh, currently, it's it's it's. I think there's a well, Carrie can describe it best, but you know, a, a resistance or reluctance on the part of the legislature to provide direct funding to private entities when it comes to stormwater. It's funding for municipalities, potentially municipal private partnerships, but um, I think there's an understanding that we need to look beyond that. And uh, certainly, you know, as this goes forward, that's really going to force that conversation. You know, how, how do we pay? We've decided that perhaps from a regulatory perspective, the most efficient and cost-effective thing to do is to focus on the larger projects because we can reduce pollution by regulating, you know, in the Champlain Basin, roughly 700 projects on two, three acre and through municipal roads. That doesn't mean all the two acre and one acre projects aren't also adding phosphorus. It's just more cost effective to do it with just the big ones instead of everybody. So is it fair that the three acre site pays a lot and the two acre site doesn't? Of course not. But how we will you know, collectively solve that, I don't know. Carrie, I don't know, I'm covering it at a superficial level. I don't know if there's anything you'd um, want to chime in on there. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll have um, more uh, information on our grants manual in the process of updating it to be clear about the, our eligibility criteria. But as, um, as of today, the legislature has voiced on a policy level that um, funding privates on, on uh, projects on private property without m municipal um, endorsement or support where the municipality would take over the um, operations and maintenance of those projects um, are currently not eligible for ecosystem restoration grants. Uh, the priority is to provide support for municipalities related to um, those projects. But it, it states there uh, as well in our manual, and we'll again try to update that to be more clear. But it does say that for all new projects or redevelopment projects that would trigger a stormwater permit, that too would not be eligible for uh, ecosystem restoration grants mm -hmm. this time. Thanks, Greg. I think on costs, I may have said thousands of millions, I meant hundreds of millions. Still, big number. No questions out in Skypeland? No. Great. Um, certainly feel free to stick around if you want to chat further. But thanks for coming, appreciate it. And just one more reminder that our next lecture will be held on November 9th with Ben Copans. He's the Basin Planner for Lake Memphremagog Watershed, as well as a few others. Uh, and he's going to be talking about rest restoration of Lake Memphremagog and the TMDL, or Total Maximum Daily Load, that was recently approved. If you haven't had an opportunity to get a glimpse of the work Ben's been doing up there, I'd highly recommend it. He's it's, it's done incredible work. It's a really interesting approach. They don't make me say that. It's, it's true. <laughs>